Well, open your Bibles this morning to Acts 2. We are uh, going to take a break from our study of Revelation because, um, well, I'm not Patrick, and so I'm going to leave that for Patrick. He's doing such a good job. I don't think he needs my help. Um, so he will come back in Revelation. And so I thought it would be, uh, it'd be interesting, it would be beneficial for us to look at the beginning of the church. Looking at the early church, I think will allow us to see why we do what we do here at CBC. Uh, I think it will remind us of why we open our Bibles, uh, why we sing hymns. Uh, but more importantly, it will remind us that we are the body of Christ, that we are the ones who are continuing the ministry Christ started. And so we're going to spend our, our next few weeks here looking at Acts 2. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13 today and then tackling the rest of the chapter in the following weeks. Uh, and in re recalling the birth of the church and being reminded of how the church got instituted, I think we'll remind us that we as, as a church are on mission now. And it will remind us of how we accomplish that mission. Uh, I, I love origin stories. Uh, I, I love uh, one of my, my favorite. Typically, my favorite movies are the first movie of a trilogy to see how everything got started. Uh, there's something about when a superhero or a character gets started on their current adventure, and, and it's a sort of discovery. It's a it's a transition from an ordinary time to to an extra extraordinary time of power, of boldness, of courage. Uh, and one of my favorite or my, my favorite origin stories uh, is Spider Man. I, I just love Spider Man. He's a a, a nerdy science geek, uh, and he gets bitten by an experimental spider, and from that bite, he gets superpowers. When I say it out loud, it sounds kind of silly, uh, but high school Sergio was like, "Yeah, this is this is there's some hope. There's some hope here." Yeah. Um, but it, it, as he gets a, as he adjusts these new powers, um, a constant phrase he keeps telling himself is, is, is um, "With great power comes great responsibility." If you look it up on YouTube, it's called the Peter Parker Principle. I didn't know that it was it has a name. Um, and if he ever forgets that, if he ever forgets what he's doing, that his main purpose, his mantra, if he loses his purpose, his goal, he stops being Spider Man. He's no longer Spider-Man. His power begins to have less impact for good. And so it's something, something that he constantly goes back to. And I think it's the same thing for us as a church. If we forget the origin story of the church, we forget, if we forget how it got started and why it got started, then the church now will begin to look very different than how God designed it. And so looking at the origin story of the church this morning, I think it's vital for us. We're gonna, we, when we look at the book of Acts, we're looking at the record of, of historical events. And when you read through Acts, you see that in a 30-year interval, a, a group of people, a group of believers, 120 people in Acts 115, grew to this worldwide phenomenon, this worldwide movement. And in fact, in Acts 17, it says it's turning the world upside down. How did it do that? How did these 120 people in a span of 30 years effectively become a world movement? And I think we get the answer in, to Acts 2. It is because the Holy Spirit was at work in a way that he was never at work in the history of man before. When you read through Acts, you see the excitement that comes as the Spirit is constantly using the church to call sinners to repentance. You see the joy of sinners turning to Christ and receiving forgiveness. You see the, the energy of the gospel as the gospel explodes from Jerusalem and goes to the Samaritans, it goes to the Gentiles. And when you read that and you've just seen the gospel transcend uh, geographical and cultural boundaries, all we could do is praise the Lord for that. Because if that didn't happen, we wouldn't be here today. And it is a unique situation of how the Lord do, did that and how the Holy Spirit moved through these men to accomplish this, such a thing. But let's not forget that, that we are also the church too. That the same spirit that we're going to read about in Acts 2 is the same spirit that is in work in us right now. 
is the same spirit that is in work in this room right now. It's not just relegated to, to history. It is, he is at work now. And we need to know this because we can become in, in danger of becoming like that superhero who forgets his purpose, who, who never uses his power for good. We need to be reminded of the Spirit's ministry to the church and the Spirit's empowerment to the church. Now, I want to take a, a little pause here. And uh, because of our Christian culture and our Christian circles, I think there is sometimes a hesitation to speak of the Spirit in this way or in a hesitation to, to look at something like Pentecost because there's a lot of debate that go, goes on with that. Right? There's a lot of things with the Pentecostal movement, with charismatics, uh, a lot of false teaching and debates. A lot, it's a lot of things that come with it. But that should not keep us from fully embracing the power of the Holy Spirit in this church at CBC. Just to be super upfront here, as uh, I, I'm a cessationist, I believe that the gifts of tongues and healings and miracles uh, were all for the transit, that, that transitory or transitionary uh, apostolic era, and those gifts are, are not normative for the church today, and that is also C, uh, the official position of CBC. But when I say that, I don't want to say that and limit God's power. Uh, I don't want to downplay the, the active role of the Holy Spirit in our lives right now. I think that's a, I think that's a danger that we, we tend to, like a pendulum, swing the other way, where the Spirit you know, we'd rather talk about the Son and the Father and the third member of the Trinity gets forgotten. I want to run to him because we need him. It is necessary for us to be spirit-filled. We need the Spirit's conviction so that we can proclaim Jesus as Lord. It is by the Spirit's guidance that we can understand Scripture and that we can grow in holiness. And it is by the Spirit's power that we evangelize the lost. None of those things are possible without the Spirit. So when we read about the Holy Spirit in Acts, we need to realize that the same power is at work in us too. So this is why we're looking at the origin story of the church. The birth of the church reminds us that we are not just a group of people who call ourselves Christians, that we are not just a social club or a support group. We are the body of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to complete the mission given to us by Christ. We are the body of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit to complete the mission given to us by Christ. And this is what we're going to see in our passage. Uh, and we're going to look at specifically three elements of the Pentecost. So the first element is the coming of the Spirit. Then we're going to look at the filling of the Spirit. And then the reaction to the Spirit. So the coming of the Spirit the feeling of the Spirit, and the reaction to the Spirit. And my hope as we study this passage is that you would be encouraged of just how much of an influence you are to this world. And not an influence because of your abilities or your skills or your wit or your charm. Nothing, it has nothing to do with you. You are an influence in this world because it is a Spirit that is in work in you and He is at work through you. It's because of the Spirit. So let's read Acts 2 together, starting from verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there, and there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because, of, because each one of them was hearing them speak his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all, uh, why, uh, why not, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that... We each hear them in our own language to which we were born. Parthians and the Medes and uh, uh, Lamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, 
uh, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the district of Libya and Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great per perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. Father, we come before you now to ask to, for you to help us. Holy Spirit, I ask you to use this message to encourage the hearts of believers here. That we would be encouraged of your work in the past and be encouraged of your work now. So Lord, guide us with your spirit. Let us see these marvelous things in your law so that we may praise you and speak the mighty deeds of God to others. Praise Jesus' name. Amen. So before we get into this passage, uh, uh, I, I, want to, I want to point out a very obvious fact that we're, that we're looking at the narrative. And the point of the narrative, of this narrative, the point of Acts, is to record how God caused the gospel to reach the nations, how God used the gospel starting from the Jews and expanded through the Gentile world. And, it, and, and this narrative chronicles how the universal church grew during this important transitional period as God shifted from primarily using Israel in the Old Testament to now using the church in the New Testament. We're looking at a transitional period here. So an important principle to remember is that when we study Acts, we should be primarily looking at this to be descriptive. It is describing a unique hist uh, the unique history of the church, and it should not be taken as uh, prescriptive. This is not something that automatically is the, the church throughout all of history will, will follow. We approach it as a unique time in history and not, something at norm uh, not as something normative for the church today. Uh, Luke, Luke is the author of Acts. He wrote the Gospel of Luke and he wrote Acts. And he actually wrote them as a uh, uh, two-volume two set. Right? You have the Gospel of Luke is one volume, Acts is the second volume. And in, in, in the first few verses of Luke, Luke 1, the Gospel of Luke, he tells his reader, I call him Theo, it's Theophilus. Um, he, tells, he tells Theo that this is the account of what happened so that you will have certainty of things you have been taught. So he lays it out right away. Like this is, this is an account. I want you to know that what I'm going to tell you is going to verify what you have heard. So it is meant to be descriptive. Now we should walk away, you know, there are certain prescriptive things here. Like we should walk away know, uh, expecting the church to be full of Gentiles, right? That's the whole point of Acts, that, that the church is now not just Jews, but Gentiles as well. Uh, but how God accompl accomplishes that is not, uh, we should not consider it normative. It's not normal to the everyday function of the church. We should read it like how we read Judges or how we read First and Second Samuel, how we read the Gospels. We read it to see God's character, to see his, his mighty deeds that he did in the past. And the Spirit uses Acts, uses this, this narrative uh, for, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Right? It is scripture and it's profitable. But again, not normative. So keep this in mind as we study our text this morning. And also if you, if you study Acts in your own personal study, uh, it, it will keep you from expecting God to do something that he hasn't promised to do um, or intended to do today. And also keep you from missing the work that he is doing today. If you start to take this as prescriptive, when it's meant to be um, descriptive. Okay, so we're going to approach Acts in, in, in that light, uh, and more can be said on that. That's, that's a whole uh, hermeneutical, principle, uh, hermeneutical principle that, that we could really dive into, um, but that is our approach this morning. So let's look at Acts 2, um, and we're going we're gonna to catch up with the apostles. When we catch up to them, we're looking shortly after the ascension of Christ. Uh, Christ had ascended into heaven, uh, about 10 days earlier. Uh, and before he left, he instructed the, the, the apostles to remain in Jerusalem. He told them to wait in Jerusalem to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And this has been promised to the, to the disciples a few times. 
Uh, John 16, 7. So uh, there's a whole bunch of passages here. I'm only going to mention a couple of them. John 16, 7, tell, uh, Jesus tells his disciples that he must go away so that the helper will come and, uh, to you. That's John 16, 7. John 7, 39 tells us that the Spirit had not yet, give, had not yet been given because Christ had not yet been glorified. So there is definitely a, an order of events that has to occur. Christ must be glorified before the Spirit can come, before the Helper can come. And that's where we find ourselves today uh, or in, in our passage. Acts 1, um, uh, in verse, um, let's start with verse 4. As gathered them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, You heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Um, you can even also go to, to John 20. Uh, we're not going to go there now, but just write down your notes, John 20, verses 19 through 22. Uh, that is, Jesus comes after um, uh, the resurrected Jesus comes to the disciples and says, I am just as the Father sent me, I am sending you out, receive the Holy Spirit. So there is a, a, a building in the past few days of, in the disciples' lives here, leading up to this moment that we're going to see in Acts 2. Um, now, I want to slow down here and just highlight something. That Jesus did not tell them to go start the Great Commission. Right? He didn't say, guys, I'm ascending. You guys get busy doing what I told you to do. Which you think you would do, because you, know, you look at Matthew 28, and it says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. But he tells them to wait. Um, and I think that's really interesting. It, it, it tells us that the task that Jesus gave to them required supernatural empowerment. It required the Holy Spirit. They were not to start this ministry until that Spirit came. You can see this in Acts 1.8. Uh, let me start with Acts 1.7. Um, he said, it's not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. This was in response to... Uh, to, the, to the apostles asking, when are, are, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? In verse 8, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And after you get this power, you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remote parts of the earth. So you see that Holy Spirit is, to, is, is power to be a witness. And I mentioned John 20 earlier. In John 20, you see that the Spirit, when Jesus said receive the Spirit, is because he just commissioned them. Or he just said, I'm sending you out just as the Father sent me out. They had this, this incredible, impossible task to do as the apostles, as, as men themselves. They had an impossible task to do. So they needed the Holy Spirit to complete this. They could not do this on their own. It takes me back to the question of, when you start Acts and you see that, 30 minute, uh, the 30 year time interval, the, the, the church explodes. It's because of the Spirit. So, this is where we find the apostles in chapter 2. They are waiting for the Spirit to come. And this brings us to our first element of Pentecost, which is the coming of the Spirit. To so the coming of the Spirit, we read in verse 1, and this is Acts 2 now. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. So we're told a couple of pieces of information here. First, we're told kind of the, the day of this occurrence, what, what day, what's going on. And we're looking at this Jewish fento, uh, festival called uh, Pentecost. Uh, that's the name in the Greek. It's also known as Festival of the Weeks. You can find this in Exodus 23, 16, Leviticus 23, 15 to 20. We don't have time to go there. Um, but it is essentially a a, a celebration of the harvest. The harvest is kind of coming to an end, and they're commemorating that with this festival of the weeks. And it started 50 days after the first Sunday after Passover. Okay, so we're looking like this is around June. Um, so it's been 50 days since, the, since the, the last Sunday of the Passover, and uh, which is where the, the Greek word comes from. When you talk about Pentecost, that's, Pentecost just means 50th in Greek. So that's where Pentecost comes from. 
And so they're, they're together during these festivals. And this is one of the three festivals that the Jewish mills were required to come to, to, come to Jerusalem, to come to the temple. So that's, that's the, the occurrence, or that's the, um, the, the occasion here. And so far, the disciples have been waiting about 10 days, right? 10 days of waiting. I just want to put myself in the disciples' shoes for a second. Ten days. You saw Jesus go up ten days ago, and you've been in Jerusalem. Now, I don't think they were doubting the Holy Spirit would come, but it's just a lot of waiting. It's just a lot of waiting. And I think it, it reminds us that, you know, a lot of us, we ask God, when are you going to answer our prayer? You know, I, I said this prayer four days ago. I said this prayer a month ago. Still no answer. Or why are you giving me, me this trial now? You know, we can ask the Lord, you know, these questions. It's, it's, that's acceptable. It's part of lamenting, right? I think, I think we, we said he's Psalm, um, I think it's Psalm 13 as a church. It says, how long, O Lord? Oh, will you forget me forever? But what I like about this is that Pentecost is one of those occurrences that reminds us that we should never question or doubt God's timing. His timing is absolutely perfect. Let me show you what I mean here. So on the day that was meant to be, celebrate the harvest, right? This is, a, this is what this festival is about. The Holy Spirit will come and empower these apostles and send these workers into the harvest. And amazingly, at the end of this day, 3,000 souls will be added to, to the church. There are 3,000 souls harvested into the kingdom. And I just don't think the apostles woke up this morning or that morning and said, I think 3,000 souls are being saved today. This was God's timing to do it. And it just highlights that he is in control of it. And not only that, I mean, if that's not enough, it is also no coincidence that, that this happens to be the busiest day in Jerusalem. Right? People are coming in for this festival. And God planned that this outpouring of the Holy Spirit what happened on a day that's bustling with Jews from all over, not just Israel, but all over the world. God knows what he is doing. And, and there may be a delay in answered prayer. And it may be uncomfortable and frightening. But we could trust God that he's using it for greater purposes greater purposes than we could possibly imagine. So we're looking at this day of Pentecost, God's ordained day to start the church. And what else do we know from chapter, from verse one here? Well, verse one says the apostles were gathered together. Um, this is likely, this is in a house, likely near the temple. Um, there are some people that say it's in the temple. I think it's near the temple because of the word for house in verse 2 is used for, for homes. There's a different word that, that Luke used for temple. So I think it's, I would say it's in the house. Um, some say that there's 120 people in the room. Uh, they go back to Acts 115. I, I really think that it, when we're looking at Acts 2, it's, it's, the, the focus is on the apostles. Um, look at the antecedent. Like they were all together in one place. Well, the antecedent is the 11 apostles in, 20, in verse 26 of chapter 1. So we're looking at the, the, the apostles. Even later on, if you go to verse 14, we're not getting there today, but it says, Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them. So there's definitely a focus on the apostles. There, there may be the, one, the, the 120 people there. I, I tend to think that it's just the apostles here. And, they're, and so they're there in this room. They're waiting. And they're not... It's not like they were seeking the Holy Spirit. They weren't doing anything for the Holy, Holy Spirit to, go, to come. This was ordained on God's timing. It was independent of what they were doing. All they had to do is wait. So they were waiting for God to act. And even though they're waiting, this happens suddenly. Verse 2. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and they appeared to them tongues as a fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And there is a lot here we could talk about. Um, I'm going to try to be brief here because there's, there's just so much to, to talk about in, in this, this passage. Uh, first, this is clear that when we're looking at Pentecost, is a visible, 
audible multi-sensory event. Okay, this is not something that goes on in the hearts of the apostles and, and no one else is pervy to it. Everyone sees it. The people on the road hear it, right? They hear this noise. So it's a very public thing. The coming of the Spirit of Pentecost, um, yeah, it, it's, it's loud, it's bright, it's sudden. And I love the language that's used here. This is The sound is like a violent rushing wind. Um, and it's a, it's a comparison here. It's not saying it, it's, it's the... It was like the like it was a violent rushing wind. Wind could have been there, but it's primarily looking at the noise. And I love how this loud, heavy, heavenly noise can only be compared to the strong force of nature. Um, I was trying to think of how it might sound like, and um, at my house, I, there's a, a train that goes by, and we're not near a train, but the train is about like a mile, mile-ish around there from my house. And I hear it. It is loud. Um, it's just the, the blaring of the horn or the whatever, I guess the horn, as it goes through the, as it goes through the station, it, it just travels around. And I'm thinking, this must have been probably louder than that. It's no wonder that people on the street heard this noise. And there's also no doubt to its source. It says, it's something that came from heaven. This is surely a divine event. Now, when we talk about spirit like a wind, I want to contrast that to something uh, Jesus said in John 3. He said that the spirit is like the wind. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. How do you know where the wind's blowing? Well, you can't see it move, right? You, you can only see it, the wind move things. Uh, as a physicist, I know that. Um, it's a joke. I, you don't need to be a physicist to know that. So when we, for example, like, let's say we have a boat, a sailboat. We know the wind is there because the sails get filled. And, the, and once the sails get filled, the boat begins to move. I think windmills also, you know, you have a windmill, there's no wind, that windmill, that windmill is stationary. Once there's wind, the windmill starts to turn and generate electricity. Well, I think the same is true for the church and the spirit. In order for the church to move, in order for the church to produce, it needs to be moved by the Holy Spirit. The spirit has to be at work. So we see the spirit here, a loud, audible sound, but there's not only the audible aspect of Pentecost, but there's also the visible aspect, right? We see that there are, that the the Holy Spirit is described as as these tongues of fire, and again, the language here is a simile. It's not it's not actual fire. The the the, the apostles' beards aren't burning up uh, because of Pentecost, but this fire-like visual is being given that to them collectively, right? It's coming to the apostles collectively, but it also distributes, right? It says distributing, uh, distributing themselves and they arrested on each one of them. And I think that's, that's, that's important because that tells us the spirit indwells in each believer. It's not that the spirit is only present when the church is gathered. The spirit is indwelling in each, each believer. You on your own, have the Holy Spirit. Now, this isn't to say that you never have to come to church, okay? Um, the Spirit uses the believers in the church. Just, the Spirit has gifted people in the church to minister to each other. But it does mean that whenever you find yourself witnessing, that you are fully equipped to share the gospel. You're fully equipped with the power of the Most High. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You don't need to call someone. You don't need to call someone in the church to, to take over. You have the Holy Spirit. He's in you and He's working in you. Not to say that there's a benefit of having two believers talking to an unbeliever, but you are sufficient because of who is in you. Right? Not you yourself, not your gifts, not, or not your abilities, but because of who, who is in you. So we have this sound like the wind, this tongues of fire. Uh, what does it all mean? In short, we're seeing the presence of God. Right? When we see fire in the Old Testament, think about the burning bush, think about the fire on Mount Sinai. 
that symbolizes the presence of God. For the wind, you could think of the Spirit of God hovering over the surface of the earth in Genesis. This is God himself coming into this room with the apostles and dwelling them and choosing to reside in them forever. Never has been done before like this. And this applies to the church today. We have the Spirit indwelling in us, the Spirit uniting us to each other. Now, I don't think any of you would say this, but just in case. In case you say, um, I don't remember seeing tongues of fire coming or a bunch of wind filling on my house, so how do I know the Spirit's there? Uh, well, you shouldn't. Okay, if that happens, uh, I don't know, call 911 or something, something's going on there. The experience that we see in Acts 2 is unique. The apostles were already believers prior to the Holy Spirit. They were believers um, when they were with Jesus. They are only the only people who are believers before the Holy Spirit was sent and believers after the Spirit was sent. Right? So they're in that transition time where God is, is using the church, is instituting the church to do new works with them. So they were believers before Jesus was glorified, so they couldn't receive the Spirit. So now they do receive the Spirit and are with Jesus in spirit. And I, I think because of that, just as there's a resurrection and incarnation, just as those events can't ever happen again, Pentecost, the initiating of the church, can't ever happen again. It is a unique time in history. Now, we do need to be, I don't, I don't want to go too far with it, we do need to be Spirit-empowered. Right? We do need the Spirit to spread the gospel, to accomplish the mission of the church. And if you are a Christian today, you are Spirit-empowered. You have gone through something called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And let me go to, let's go to, uh, let's turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12. So the phrase, as you turn there, the phrase in Acts 1-5, be baptized with the Holy Spirit, same phrase used over here, 1 Corinthians 12, and we're going to start in verse, verse 12. Okay, and now remember what we're looking at now. We're not looking at a narrative anymore, right? This is a, um, we're, we're looking at a letter. It's, it's intended to be instructive, right, to the church. So Paul writes, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit, we're all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks or slaves or free, we're all made to drink of one Spirit. When we talk about baptism of the Holy Spirit, that happens when you're unified to the body. That happens when you're unified to Christ, when you become part of the body of Christ. And when does that happen? Well, that happens at conversion. Because we are now past the, the, the sending of the Spirit, right? We are now past Pentecost, past that transitional period of the apostolic era. And so we Im are immediately put into the body of Christ. Now, I think this is just, I don't want to go too fast to that. I think this is an amazing grace on its own. You don't have to do anything to become part of the church universal. Once you become a believer, that's it. There's no hoops for you to try or to jump through. There's, there's nothing yet to prove to become part of the church, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It happens as, as grace upon grace upon grace. It is only by this Holy Spirit that we are united to Christ and to each other in Christ. And you are eternally and graciously joined to the family of God and indwelled by His Spirit. There's nothing you can do to get it. It is by grace, not by works. There's nothing you could do to get out of it. <laughs> you are a believer, and you are in the body of Christ. God will keep you in the body of Christ. It is amazing grace. Now, this happens for the first time in Acts 2. All right, let's go back to Acts 2. Acts 2 is, again, a pivotal point in, in the history of the church, in the history of redemption. So the apostles were... We're already believers, but now they're joined together. They did not have the fullness of spirit in them, but now in Acts 2 they do. And, and that's why we celebrate Acts 2. It's the birth of the church. 
God took this group of uneducated Galileans and made them his body. It is through them and by extension through us that Jesus continues his ministry to the world and it has to do with this Pentecost. It, that wouldn't have happened without Pentecost. So this is the coming of the Spirit is one element. And we're going to go move on and look at verse 4. In verse 4, we see the filling of the Spirit. So turn, let's read verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So we see that filling of the Spirit comes. Uh, the, dis the disciples are described now as filled with, with the Holy Spirit. If you look at that phrase and when, when it's used, uh, that phrase is used in Luke a couple times, a lot of times in Acts. And each time that phrase is used, filled with the Holy Spirit, it is used for the proclamation of God's word. And also important to note here that when we look at tongues, these tongues in Act 2 is referring to the real languages, languages that people speak and could understand and hear. Now, we can really get into the weeds with this, so, so I'll, I'll try to be brief here. In verse 6 and 11, the crowd confirms this, right? The crowd say they're speaking in, the, in, in our own languages specific to the places that we are from. Okay, so just note that, put it in your back pocket, that, that when we look at this phrase for tongues, we're looking at real languages. It's important to remember for, for other passages, uh, especially when Paul talks about the gifts of tongue, that we're looking at a very real language being spoken here. Now, there's a lot of confusion also with being filled with the Spirit and, and versus baptism with the Spirit. I want to point out here uh, quickly that these are not the same um, they're not the same things. Being filled with the Spirit does not always accompany receiving the Holy Spirit. Uh, you can see that at the end of chapter 2. At the end of chapter 2, 3,000 believers uh, receive the Spirit. It doesn't mention anything about being filled with the Spirit and it doesn't mention anything about tongues. Uh, you can also look in Acts uh, 8. In Acts 8, you see people are receiving the Holy Spirit, but again, no mention of being filled by the Spirit or tongues. So even in Acts, being filled by the Spirit and, and tongues is not a normative behavior. It's not a usual thing. Sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and when it does happen, it's for very specific situations. Being filled with the Spirit primarily occurs in Acts as we saw, and it's always around the proclamation of God's word. What we're looking at is a special empowering of the spirit for the unique ministry of the early church, a special empowering. And the purpose of this empowering, the purpose of it was to spread the gospel, right? To the Samaritans, as hasn't happened before, to the Gentiles, and, all the, and Samaritans and Gentiles, now these are God's family. And God needed to show the, the apostles that this could happen. Acts 11, 17, it's a great place to go for that. Uh, we won't go there now, but in Acts 11, 17, Peter's reporting to the apostles and what he saw the, the, from the Gentiles, that the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit, that the Gentiles started speaking in tongues. And Paul, uh, sorry, Peter, Peter says, who was I that I could stand in God's way? He clearly saw the Gentiles speaking in tongues, and he recognizes that as God including Gentiles into the salvation plan. And Peter says, I, I couldn't do anything about it. This is, what, this is God's will. So being filled with the Spirit and speaking in tongues has a very specific purpose during this transitional time. Okay, so speak, I say all that. What's the point of verse 4 then? Right, if, if, if we don't speak in tongues now, if, if being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't look the same now, what's the point of verse 4? Here's the point that the explosive and enduring growth we see in Acts comes down to the church being spirit-filled. That's the point. We need to be spirit-filled as well. And we need to remember that the same spirit that we're seeing in, verse, in, in, in uh, chapter 2 is the same spirit that was in work in us since the moment of our conversion. But it doesn't look the same way. Here's a quick illustration. I... I like uh, gardening, and earlier this year I started, I started gardening from seeds. I, I had a little pot and I put a seed in it, and I took really good care of it. I had this, this pot with a seed in my room um, and, and watered it multiple times a day. 
I think Daniela called them my plant babies, which a big, okay, that makes me feel weird. Um, but so I had to take care of it really good. And, and the plants started to grow. It started to see leaves and the, and the growth started coming quick. It started getting pretty tall. Um, I took that plant, put it in the garden, and it sunk its, deep, its roots deep. I didn't have to water it as much anymore. And, and it became a, a strong plant. It's producing uh, eight plants today. Um, so it still needed watering, but the, 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 the method of watering looked different. Right? It, lo it looked a little different. Well, the, the same thing is similar for the church. In the early years, the church needed a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The early church faced fierce opposition very, very quickly. And the, the Holy Spirit was there causing, causing it to grow. However, as the, as the roots of the church grew and embedded itself in the Word of God, and the Word of God became available to the church, the Holy Spirit now fed us through this Word, through the Bible. So we still need the Holy Spirit today. We still have to be Spirit-filled, but it looks a little different. It looks a little different. It's not the same as in the state of transition. So how, how does the spirit fill look like? How does it look like for CBC? For CBC to be spirit-filled, how does that look like? Ephesians 5, let's flip there really quick. Ephesians 5, 18. Okay, and do not, uh, this is Paul writing, and do not get drunk with wine for that is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. Now you're saying, Sergio, I thought you said that was only an ax. Well, uh, 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 it's kind of true. Um, uh, when I say filled with the Spirit, that's a, that's a different Greek construction there. Uh, so that's one thing. And it's also a different context, right? So, and it's also a different verb for filled. So it, it is technically, you know, it's a different thing here. Um, but the context is huge, that we're, we're looking at uh, an instructive letter, that this is, in fact, pers uh, prescriptive. This, we're not looking at something descriptive here. So it says, uh, Paul writes, and be filled with the Spirit. And how does that look like? Look at verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So that being filled pretty much incorporates every relationship that we have here. Right? See verses 22 through, the, through uh, chapter 6 of Ephesians. It, it includes every relationship we have here. It includes what we did prior to me coming up here, which is singing, singing hymns and spiritual, uh, uh, spiritual songs and hymns. It includes all that because what we're doing there is we're singing to the Lord, we're praising the Lord, we're thanking Him, giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're also speaking to one another in hymns. That's, I mean, that's spirit-filled. And just like, the, the, just like in Acts 2, Acts 2, the apostles were speaking in different languages the mighty deeds of God. Well, that's the message of a spirit-filled believer. That's what we do on, on a Sunday morning. We speak the mighty deeds of God, particularly the mightiest deed of God, which is sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. Colossians 3.16, a parallel passage, also links what it means to be spirit-filled by having the word of, of Christ dwelling, um, richly dwelling in us. So the spirit, the spirit-filled life is centered on the word. Ephesians 4, a spirit-filled life, a spirit-filled church is full of unity. So I don't think it's any question that we need the spirit. I think we all know that. But it's good to ask ourselves whether we are seeking to be spirit-filled. Are we in the Word asking the Spirit for enlightenment? Are we depending on His power when we evangelize? Are we praying that He use us to encourage each other and to build up the church? And are we asking Him to grow our love for Jesus and our desire to share the gospel? That's spirit-filled. It has, to be, it has to keep going back to Him. It has to be going back to the Spirit. So we have the same Spirit. It looks differently, but we have, a, we have the filling of the Spirit. And we'll quickly look at the reaction to the Spirit. So verses, this is going to be verses 5 through the following. In verse 5, 
So there were these Jews in Jerusalem, and when they heard the sound, the crowds came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing their own language speak. They were amazed. They were astonished. So I, I think at some point the, the, the apostles moved from this room down to the streets. And, and I like to think that having the Spirit empower them, uh, having been baptized with the Spirit, that the Spirit just caused them to move towards the lost. That their mission required them to go. So they went. And they went out speaking the native tongues given to them by the Spirit. And the people's reaction is interesting. They, they're completely confused. Um, I found one div- definition for the, ver- uh, for the word there in verse 7, amazed, uh, is a state of mind in which things seem to make little sense. Right? So uh, that, sounds like, that sounds like me when I'm looking at the housing market. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what this is. They're just so confused. Uh, and here are these people coming from, now try to me- imagine this map here, coming from Jerusalem, coming from Egypt, coming from North Africa, from modern-day Iran, from Turkey, from Rome, probably from Greece. There are all these people here not expecting to hear their own language, right? Imagine if you're in, a, 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 uh, in another country where English is seldom spoken, and you hear it. You'll, your ears will perk up. You'll hear that immediately. They hear their own languages here, and they did not expect to hear that. And... Above that, these are coming from a group of people who are Galileans. They are considered uneducated. So many things to them are just not making sense. And I see two reactions here. In the midst of this confusion, I see two reactions. One reaction is of, is of curiosity. So look at verse 12. So the people all continued in amazement and great perplexity. Uh, another one for perplexity is just at a loss. Saying to one another, what does this mean? So one Reaction is curiosity. And, and Peter's going to provide an answer. We're going we're to see that next week. But I think this is a great picture of, of how we interact with the world, world around us. That people see the way we live our lives. They see how different it is. And they get curious about it. I have a story about this. Um, Millie's uh, therapist, um, her speech therapist, used to come to our house. And uh, her, Millie, and Danielle would spend a lot of time together. Um, and, and one day, uh, the speech therapist said, um, asked Daniela, how, that's a weird question, how do we make our marriage work? I don't know what exactly she saw that prompted her to ask that. Um, I think the sense of humor that Daniela and I have together, it's, it could cause some um, people to get offended. <laughs> but for some reason, she, she asked, why, how does this work for you guys? And um, Daniela responded, is that the only way it works is because of Jesus. Because we're both striving to be like Jesus. And I think that's just a great picture of, of what a spirit-filled life leads to. It leads to curiosity on the part of the unbeliever. It, it doesn't make sense with a lot of the, the choices we make, with the feelings that we we, um, we go through during trials. We just stand out. So people are curious, and that's an opportunity to share the gospel. We need to take advantage of those moments. We are spirit-filled, and when those moments come along, we depend on the spirit to, to preach the gospel. The other reaction here in verse 13 is, is one of, of dismissal. Um, Verse 13, there, some are, are looking at the apostle and it's just saying they're drunk. I, I always have a, a problem with this. I just think like, what are you drinking that causes you to speak other languages that you don't know of? It's just, I, I don't get it. But there are these skeptics who dismiss and, and mock the obvious manifestation of grace before them. So what does Peter do? Well, he just responds to them. And, and we're going to see that next week. He, he tells them what God is doing. And that should be our response. Don't, don't discount the loss. Don't discount the, the, the stubborn, um, uh, hostile unbeliever. Because for all we know, those people who are saying full of sweet wine could have been part of the 3,000 who received forgiveness. With patience, and full conviction, we tell the most stubborn people about the mighty deeds of God. 
and we are ready to be amazed by how the Spirit works. So we've seen the coming of the Spirit, the filling of the Spirit, and the reactions to the Spirit. And again, these are unique circumstances in, her, in, in our church history. And there's a lot of encouragement and application, but I just want to close with three points here. Three practical points. First practical point is that you are equipped for the task of evangelism. If you are a believer here today, you are equipped for evangelism. The Spirit is not a relic in the past. It is not confined to the pages of history. The Spirit is active in our church. Even now, even this moment, He is at work. You are empowered by the same Spirit to accomplish the same mission given to the apostles. That the gospel will go forth to the ends of the earth. I like to put it this way. The Holy Spirit will work through us in the timing ordained by the Father so that we could proclaim the good news of the Son. Remember, we, are, we worship a Trinitarian God and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all at work. The Holy Spirit will work through us in the timing ordained by the Father so that we could proclaim the good news about the Son. Point number two. Is the Spirit of God in you? Question, is the Spirit of God in you? You know this is the case if you proclaim Jesus is Lord. The only way you could proclaim Jesus is Lord is if it was revealed to you by the Spirit. But maybe you haven't submitted to Christ and maybe you're like, you're like the crowd, you're curious. Or maybe you've been dismissive of the gospel. If this is you this morning, then I, I want to plead with you to turn to God today. Submit to Christ today. He died on the cross so that you can have forgiveness of sin. He rose from the dead so that you can have eternal life with him. It is a free offer of grace. There's no catch here. There's no gimmick. It is apart from anything you can do to earn your way to heaven. You come empty and he will make you full. Fully entrust yourself to Christ today. Today, you can have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. You can have freedom from the bondage of sin. You can have peace. You can have assurance that there is life after death. So it's the Spirit of God dwelling in you. And last point this morning, if you, if you do have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, you, if the Spirit is in you, you are and forever will be in God's family. This is a marvelous grace about spirit baptism. That not by your own efforts, not by your own merits, simply by the grace of God, you are secured, secured as a son and daughter of God. The sins of yesterday, the sins of tomorrow, will not disqualify you from worship with God and will not disqualify you from worship, worship, uh, worship with the church. Instead, you will always be met with grace with restoration because the Spirit has united you to the body of Christ. This is the amazing grace that we see in Acts 2. Let's praise the Lord.